Bitcoin ordinals are all the buzz right now. What are they? How do they work? And have they contributed to the higher transaction costs we've seen on the Bitcoin base layer? We're here to discuss this and the future of cryptocurrency mass adoption with Rena Shaw. She is a head of operations and strategy at Trust Machines and was previously the head of exchange at Binance US. Rena, welcome to my show, The David Lynn Report. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Pleasure hosting you. Let's talk first about uh, the transaction fees for Bitcoin. Um, it's been spiking up. Uh, well, most recently in the last couple of days, it's come down. But a couple of days ago, it was at the, the all-time high since 2021. And of course, in 2021, we had more traffic because there was a lot more volume because the price was going up. But here, we're not seeing a price increase along with a higher transaction fees uh, spike. And so people are wondering what's causing the surge. There is a couple things causing the surge in Bitcoin transaction fees. The first is a new phenomenon called ordinals. So ordinals are akin to a Bitcoin NFT, but a little bit different with extra properties. The way I would put it is that ordinals encompass all of the metadata of whatever you're inscribing directly on chain and that it's immutable and written into the block space. They also have a number schema that are attached to each Satoshi, the smallest unit of Bitcoin. And so you actually can track each unit of Bitcoin via ordinal as well. So it's like, it allows for a whole host of different use cases per se. What people are finding really interesting with ordinals versus other styles of NFTs is that it is written into the Bitcoin block space, meaning it's immutable. So when I inscribe something, whether it be a JPEG, a video, um, an audio recording, or even a game, some sort of file, in that block time when it's confirming on chain, usually 10 minutes, that's it. That means so long as one Bitcoin node is running, that file will be there forever. It's a lot more powerful if you think of that in comparison to like cloud storage, because this is not centralized run. It's run by the most decentralized blockchain to exist. So let, let's drill a bit deeper. So why are people building NFTs called ordinals on Bitcoin? To my knowledge, it's a recently it's a it's a recently launched uh, protocol, right? I think as of January twenty twenty three, it was launched. So um, yeah, yeah. So y NFTs traditionally were built on other protocols like uh, Ethereum. Ethereum was very popular for NFT construction, but now people are moving to Bitcoin. Why is that? So there were two kind of grandstanding network upgrades that have made Bitcoin to have a little bit more functionality. One was Taproot, one was Segwit. So basically you have one increased the amount of space you can use within the block space to four megabytes. And then the second is to batch the transactions to make it a little bit more scalable. Because of that, now people are like challenging the norm of can you build on Bitcoin? The answer is you can build on Bitcoin. And so... There has been growing chatter per se that Bitcoin deserves to have more functionality to be more productive because it is the most liquid of asset classes in crypto. And so people are moving away from, instead of building on chains or other protocols per se that are more centralized, let's bring it back to the most decentralized blockchain and most secure blockchain. So a lot of people are using ordinals as high value settlements. So think luxury goods on chain as that style of NFT rather than everyday community NFTs. And tell us a bit more about these ordinals. So they were launched a few months ago. Um, what are some of the use cases of ordinals and how do they directly contribute to the higher transaction fees that we're seeing? I think it's a little bit early to tell what the use cases are because we've only been live since... Uh, late December of 2022. But if you were to equate it to, I want to create something to live forever that has high value, whether it be dollar value, emotional value, you may choose to inscribe it as an ordinal. Um, just the other day, there was a interview with Michael Saylor and he was talking about he would inscribe his will, his last will and testament as an ordinal because he wants that to live forever. So it's almost bringing back the idea of if something is important to you, would you inscribe it to keep the digital archive or would you not? How it's increasing to the like, transaction fees and such is that this is the first time that 
miners are actually being paid more to process transactions to validate the transactions as opposed to creating a new Bitcoin block. So it's a little bit different from like a paradigm shift of what we've seen over um, kind of the extent, the existence of Bitcoin mining. Now it's actually profitable to validate just transactions in addition to mining the block. So there's a two-sided marketplace. Um, and then for perspective, uh, if you were to think about minor revenue right now, we're at an all-time high. Just the other day, I saw data for the mining distributions made. The fees were $29 million in a day. Some has been as high as 40 For perspective, that has not occurred in the history of Bitcoin. So the miners are getting rewarded more because of what's happening now? Is that is that a summary? Right. So there's now demand for the Bitcoin network, demand for the block space. The network is getting congestion. More miners have to come online just to process the transactions. So typically miners have come online to create the new blocks. Now it's let me validate the transactions too. So both sides of mining are being um, utilized more so than ever. And I, I'm wondering why uh, you would one would even use an ordinal to uh, ins inscribe a file. Uh, going back to you know whether it be a will, if you're a Michael Saylor or anything fun, um, why can't I just put that on a hard drive? <laughs> do you want it live forever? Do you want it to be free from centralized authority? And do you want it to always be available and unchanged? Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and give a personal example. Uh, I had a loved one pass. I've inscribed every single voicemail that I've had from that loved one. So their voice lives forever on chain. So in the event that Apple does not own me with iCloud, I have always an archived copy that so long as I run one Bitcoin node, it will be there. That's a powerful saying that that is free from any um, censorship whatsoever. Because that's what Bitcoin was used for. Yeah. Certainly, that's a beautiful example, but uh, I could see um, regulators eyeing this space soon as people start to misuse the system. It wouldn't be difficult to uh, imagine that a, a, a cyber criminal inscribes some sort of code that could be damaging or people steal things and put it on there. Is it accessible to everybody once you inscribe a file? Just the location of the unit of Satoshi that it's inscribed to is accessible, but not my actual file as I've encrypted it. So like there are plenty of security measures you can take for whatever sensitive nature of what you're putting on chain. So it's it's kind of a double-edged sword because on the one hand you have this you know this new thing that we can use perhaps uh, a new way to store files safely and uh, and, and and we have miners being rewarded more but these transaction fees have made it more difficult to use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange, which if you look at the Bitcoin white paper, initially it was created as a peer-to-peer -peer exchange system. Now it's being made to you build NFTs on. So not what Satoshi had envisioned. What is the solution to higher transaction costs? Yeah, but anyway, go on. So I would maybe challenge that. So maybe not quite what Satoshi envisioned for like Bitcoin as an asset, not, but it's, I wouldn't say it's fair for like Bitcoin as a blockchain. So there are like forums in 2010 of like Bitcoin talk where Satoshi did envision a world where you build on top of Bitcoin via layers. So like he envisioned a world that you could have like scalable systems built within Bitcoin just on top and may not be to the main, main core chain of Bitcoin. So coming back to what you had asked, Bitcoin needs layers to scale. So there are limitations with Bitcoin as of right now. There is no smart contracts platform with Bitcoin like what Ethereum has, right? So you do have to create those verticals to allow it. Now, there are a couple layers on market. You have Lightning, the most popular layer that is used to batch transactions through open channels and make payments very cheap and fast and accessible. You have RSK, which also is a a layer that allows for smart contract functionality via uh, a drive chain that's EVM compatible. There is Stacks, uh, another layer that reuses the proof of work consensus mechanism to allow for smart contracts with final settlement on Bitcoin. So you can utilize these layers to build products that scale. 
Um, and uh, can you comment on any layer twos or layer, I guess we'll stick to layer twos, but any layer two um, systems that you think will gain the most traction over the coming months or years? I think the one that has been gaining the most traction lately has been Stacks with Lightning. So both of those have been gaining traction. Stacks has been, because of its unique properties of having Bitcoin final settlement, you can see it as a, an easy way to move Bitcoin from the L1 to the L2, deploy it in your range of DeFi, DAO, NFT applications, and then come back to the L1 when it makes sense for you. Lightning does not have smart contracts, but you can use discrete log um, contracts to like create scalable payment solutions. So those are the two that have been gaining the most traction, but it's still early for like what the Bitcoin economy can look like. Because when you think about the Bitcoin economy right now, we're a little bit limited that all we have is people who participate via buying, selling, holding, and then you have miners. We don't have the other incentive cases of per se DeFi apps on Bitcoin or Bitcoin DAOs or all of those other robust mechanisms that you see on Ethereum, Solana, take your pick. But we're starting to see people building them now through these layers, um, Stacks, RSK, Liquid. Like people are now wanting to come back to Bitcoin as a as a chain. And I think there's I would say one more thing. I think there's value in coming back to Bitcoin as a chain. When you think about the network capital of Bitcoin as the asset, you have $500 billion to unlock and deploy directly into products, smart contracts, um, dApps, and such. If you were to compare that to Ethereum, so that Ether as a token has like $200, $250 million, or $250 billion, um, I'd have to look up the current market stats for today, but that's like on the surface level, but the value below the surface of what Ether has via stable points, via scaling solutions like Optimism and Polygon is equal in amount. So like it is one flywheel economy, but Bitcoin needs the beneath the surface right now. If an investor were to ask you, Rina, in the future, or perhaps even presently, uh, will the emergence of new applications and, and smart contracts build on Bitcoin have a material impact on the price of Bitcoin, what would you say? I think there's always a chance and a possibility, but I don't want to necessarily speculate. But if you create um, the flywheel economy of products and actually use cases of Bitcoin, um, then I think it will drive value to the asset itself. The way I see it is that you can have experiments on all other chains but if you want the experiment to be high value, you're going to bring it back to Bitcoin. Do you okay? Let's talk about something else here. We we have we have um, this debate between uh, the security side and the commodity side. Which camp is crypto in? Which camp is Bitcoin in? I think Gary Gensler has come out and said that every single crypto besides Bitcoin should be a security. And um, I, 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 I like you to just comment on that. On the from the regulatory perspective first before we move on to um your 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 thesis i view bitcoin as a commodity i view it even more so as a commodity as traditional commodities for perspective i came from the oil and gas industry and um clearly oil is a commodity it is a very centralized commodity i'll be the first to say it because there's so few players with it bitcoin is a different style of commodity it it has the properties of sound money um, a, a means of commerce and things like that. But it also has something that you can do more with it, which in my opinion, gives it more of a commodity, it leans into a commodities landscape. You wrote um, on your own website, I inherently believe cryptocurrency will be the next global commodity like oil. I'm interested to get your perspective on that because you, uh, prior to working in the crypto industry, you were a uh, oil engineer. Um, I think you designed mining rigs. So and that's right. Uh, I was offshore with an, an oil company. So if you ever watched the movie like Deepwater Horizon, like out in the rigs in the middle of the Gulf, that was me. Okay. Um, why are you comparing Bitcoin to a global commodity like oil? I think there has been enough correlations made that people view Bitcoin as a 
store of value an asset that you hedge against? And I would say, yes, that is 100% in my opinion, the case. Now, oil is not necessarily something I would per se hedge, uh, hedge as my store of value for like my personal um, asset like portfolio. But what I think is special about Bitcoin is that there is so much that you can do with it that leans into kind of a macro investment thesis for however you do your asset allocation. With that in mind, to me, that makes it a commodity. I think um, it is a global decentralized market where anybody can access, which is more so than even some other commodities on markets, because it is not easy to trade some of the other asset classes for an everyday person. You know, we when we think about oil, we think about something that is pretty much indispensable to most people's lives, unless you live completely off grid. Off grid. But um, even even people driving electric cars, you know, petroleum is used for more than just gas and diesel. It's 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 a it's a product we use for the construction of of everyday materials like plastic. And so it's it's not something that we can live without. And it's kind of a stretch. Some people would say it's kind of a stretch to imagine Bitcoin as being as indispensable as something like oil. How would you challenge that statement? Bitcoin gives me the access to like an alternative financial system that will actually serve me without censorship. It is the concept of trust without centralization. Like that's why Bitcoin came about. If you think about it, Bitcoin came out in 2008 after the financial crisis. And this was the alternative means of if I'm in a country that has inflation or an authoritative regime, how do I make sure I'm safeguarding an asset that will be there for me and be there for everyday commerce and life? I would argue Bitcoin, Bitcoin actually serves that purpose. What, well, what's wrong with the uh, local fiat currency of whatever jurisdiction you're in for exactly the same purpose? Well, I mean, in America, we just went through three banks closing in the last um, three months, right? So a lot of people didn't have access to financial assets that are in that should be in their possession. I'd say I'm not sure about everybody else, but I want something that always is custodied with myself. Okay, so then somebody might challenge you and say, "Well, Reno, FTS collapsed, Celsius collapsed. Can we make the same parallels with with the with the crypto industry? What's different about what the collapse with the centralized banks?" or exchanges within within crypto versus the banks that we have here, like uh, so, Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah. So those are still centralized venues of I'm giving my assets into a custodian. But that's not why, that's not like necessarily the core ethos of crypto. The core ethos is that you can self-custody it. You can take your coins to your own private keys, to your own cold storage and keep that with you. And with that, no one else can touch it. So I'd say like there's like different parallels, like people can choose their own risk profiles, whether you want to use an centralized exchange or a qualified custodian. But this system gives you the alternative if I don't want to trust anyone except myself. I can't say that with the I can't say that I can do that with fiat unless I withdraw all of my assets, put it in cash and keep it in some under the mattress like situation. But if I if I use a Bitcoin wallet to custody my wealth, for example, which a lot of people do, I still have the problem of having to convert that to a fiat to use for my daily expenses. I mean, most there, people don't yeah. Yeah, I mean it's still uh, a growing adoption curve for more and more merchants to accept Bitcoin payments, but I won't say that it's not nothing like the trend is still emerging more and more so like it will it will happen over time. Do you see a company like Apple Pay uh, accepting Bitcoin payments or putting that on their on their uh, payment rail? I think there is a possibility like Cash App is doing it. But there's still the problem of the higher transaction costs, right? So to have to be we have to build a layer two on top of that or how do we how do payment systems mitigate that problem? And slower as well. Like, you know, you, you stand in line to, at a Starbucks and you scan with Bitcoin, you have to wait for the block to complete it slower than just using your cash. <laughs> well, I think for the Starbucks example, I would say you could use Lightning Network because that's right. almost instantaneous. Okay. 
Okay. Um, I, I see your point. Like it's still very early, but our finance, this financial system has only existed since 2008. So like we're allowed to like take our time to build it in a sustainable and scalable way. So that leads to my next question, which is how we can get the masses to adopt Bitcoin as either a store of value or a medium of exchange. Um, certainly, you know, the, the, the crypto market cap overall is still a fraction of equities, bonds, real estate, and every other investable asset class. You know, how, how does Bitcoin become a four tr $14 trillion uh, market, which is the size of gold, for example? I think mean, like the access to Bitcoin still has to go mainstream. We're not quite there. So like for perspective, I think about 4% of the global population owns Bitcoin. So a very small percentage. But what's interesting is that you can own any set of Bitcoin. So you you have like the flexibility for the smallest of unit. In order to get us to like mass adoption and mass scale, there really needs to be stellar usable products with Bitcoin. We don't quite have that yet for like the limitations of no smart contracts, but we're mitigating that by using different L2s, L3s with Bitcoin to create those products, but it just takes a lot of time to build. So the main chain is very resistant to change. Like Bitcoin only goes through a network upgrade every four or five years, give or take. But because of that, it maintains its security aspect. So if you want to see a Bitcoin mass adoption, you need four stellar products that show um, what Bitcoin can do as a programmable layer. And uh, is that what you're working on right now at Trust Machines? Yeah, so our our marching kind of ethos is that we wanna onboard at least 1 billion people into Bitcoin via Web3. Um, in order to do that, there needs to be core products that make the user journey frictionless as if you were on um, a normal financial rails or normal uh, normal rails whatsoever. And so we are kind of filling the gap on creating products like um, Bitcoin Web3 wallets, uh, Bitcoin DeFi applications, both for emerging markets and institutions, um, secure communications through uh, community chats and things like that, all powered by Bitcoin. Okay. Um, we, I want to ask you about the correlation between Bitcoin and risk assets. The conversation we've had thus far talks about applications of Bitcoin that have nothing to do with pure, pure speculation or investments, which um, up until now have been dominant use cases of Bitcoin, some would argue. But we're talking about a future of Bitcoin that extends beyond just um, investments. And so we're starting to see a breakaway from uh, the NASDAQ, it, it happened very briefly. It's not a significant decoupling. I'll show a chart on the screen. But some people have argued that Bitcoin is going to start trading more like gold as a store of value and less like a risk asset, which is to say that it'll decouple completely from stocks. Do you see that happening anytime soon? I think it will happen. It's a slow and gradual shift. It started occurring just in the last couple of weeks when, um, what was it, First Republic, uh, you know, had its challenges. And so people are looking at Bitcoin as something to be there online at all times. And it's a different style of asset now. Um, compared to like risk assets on the equity side, it will take a long time for it to fully decouple. But Bitcoin has proved its worth of being a store of value, similar to like digital gold. It's just a matter of convincing the masses that uh, well, to share your viewpoint, right? It, it is a matter. It is a matter of convincing the assets, um, the masses for this viewpoint. But you know, a lot of like marquee asset management firms are like within this thesis. So um, I'm not sure if it was the 2022 end report from Fidelity, but Fidelity did put out an in investing guidance that you know three to five percent of your asset allocation it might be worthwhile to look at Bitcoin. You know, we, we talked about the the evolution of Bitcoin's use case. I, I'm curious to get your view on what would challenge Bitcoin as the dominant cryptocurrency. Um, what are some existential threats facing Bitcoin today, you think? One is that it's finite. So like that's, that's all we get. But 
that's to say the same that other assets like oil, gold are also finite for like what you can actually extract and recover as well. I think the other challenge with Bitcoin is that um, it is difficult to build on and it is difficult. It is like somewhat resistance change. Um, so to add the scalability functionalities that you need to make Bitcoin widely used, it will take some time. But what I find kind of inspiring about Bitcoin than like others is that because it's decentralized, because anybody can participate by um, acquiring some position of Bitcoin or uh, participating in governance, I find this to be different. Lastly, have you ever bought Pepe coin? I have not bought Pepe coin. I am curious about it. I think it's fun that um, there is some lightheartedness in the industry with meme coins and such. And, you know, uh, the, the frog is the new dog. Yeah, it's all fun and games. I have to say that it's all fun and games until somebody gets rug pulled. Every now and then you get a meme coin that's just a scam. I'm not saying pet base is scam. I'm just saying that some others have been that way. Um, wow. Certainly we've seen an increase in gas fees. I don't know if they're correlated. Yeah, I'll let you comment. Pardon? I'll, I'll let you comment on, um, on, 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 on gas fees on, on Ethereum and whether that's related to uh, the meme coins that we've seen pop up. I think there is some loose correlation. I think Pepe, the one that you're ta asking about, it within um, like a few weeks, it has, I think, almost a billion dollar market cap within like a couple weeks. That's not nothing. And it's definitely adding to some network congestion and increased fees for Ethereum. But, uh, but luckily, Ethereum is going through and um, has just gone through an upgrade. So scalability is coming. What would change your mind about Pepe? Somebody, somebody, let's say, comes to you and says, Rina, buy a meme coin, buy Pepe. Well, it's Pepe today. It doesn't matter. It could be pizza coin. It could be whatever, Doge 3.0, you know, and, and then you ask, you ask that person why, and he says, why not? What's the rest of this conversation? <laughs> Give me some utility. Show me what Pepe can do for me. Is it like, um, a token that gives me membership into a community to exclusive benefits? Is it um, like Link style where your membership allows you to enter the golf course that they bought? Show me some utility. I just haven't seen it from Pepe, but that's my personal opinion. Um, I, I've gotten the opinion that, no, actually it's not an opinion. I think they've stated by their own admission, it doesn't do anything. Uh, well, but... then, 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 then let it live on like Doge. <laughs> <laughs> Doge was the icon for Twitter for a while. So <laughs> let's not forget that. There's some utility there. But thank you, Rena. I appreciate your uh, insights. And uh, can people learn more about your work in Trust Machines? Where can we go? Um, I'm on Twitter. The handle is Rena P. Shaw. And uh, if anyone wants to reach me, my email is Rena at trustmachines.co. Okay, excellent. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.